Hey, what's up, guys? And welcome to episode 91 of Talk 4, the quickfire podcast where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. That's me. And let me introduce our incredible guest for today. I've been so excited for this for so long. The Blue Angels Executive Officer, Commander John Fay, who's going to be answering some questions today. John, welcome aboard the Talk 4 podcast. Please just say hi to the fine people listening and just tell us a little bit about what you do and who you are. And then we're going to shoot some questions. Yeah, good morning, Louie. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on the Talk 4 podcast and uh, to be able to kind of have this uh, opportunity to, to share our story with your listeners. We're glad to be here. Fantastic, man. Um, I mean, I can only say I'm glad to be here. This is honestly something I've just anticipated for so long and just absolutely an honor to have you here. In fact, I've got a little something to show you here. So just a little bit of a a story. So when I was a young kid, I used to be so into aviation and fighter jets and stuff. And I only kind of went back through some of the stuff I had as a kid just recently. And I came across this little chap here, Blue Angel was number two from God knows how long ago. And honestly, just me back then, if I knew we'd get to a stage where I had someone like you on the show here, I would just be absolutely thrilled. So honestly, thank you so much for uh, for being here, John. No, I, I uh, like I said, the, the, the honor's all mine. Uh, and, and I share that, you know, that same regard. I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, my my uh, family, we live pretty much right on the, the near the departure end of what was Carswell Air Force Base. And, you know, got to see the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds and, you know, all sorts of other aircraft that would uh, that would take off and, and fly out of there. And so as a little kid. Uh, those immediately were, you know, were instant heroes of mine. And I think we all, uh, a lot of us share that story as Blue Angels kind of growing up that we, uh, we get to, to see these, uh, you know, famous, uh, iconic aircraft and, uh, and they make such a big impression on us. But uh, it, it's interesting to now be in the, in the blue flight suit and be a part of it. Um, I, you know, it's, it's a definitely a bunch of pinch me moments. But, um, you know, getting to know the, the number two on our team right now to Commander Chris Cheese Kapishansky, um, I'm always like, this is, you know, this is pretty cool. As a kid, I never would have uh, imagined that, you know, I'd be able to call him a friend and that my kids would be able to, you know, get to know the guy flying that right wing uh, aircraft. It's, it's a pretty cool moment. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we're regular folks that just have a, a an, an awesome job and an incredible privilege to get out and and do what we do showcasing the the navy and marine corps awesomeness oh absolutely and you know I, I know from obviously i'm in the uk and i know people who view us i mean so the whole nation does people view for example our red arrows as almost literally heroic and absolutely the same for the blue angels so just before we dive into the questions just tell me what is it like to wake up in the morning and know that you are you and you have this job <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, and I, I probably didn't explain it too well uh, previously, but it's uh, it's humbling, and I, 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 it's humbling in the sense that, um, and and an honor in the sense that what you're what you're doing is is way bigger than just you. Um, our mission is to showcase the teamwork and professionalism of the United States Navy and Marine Corps, you know, uh, through pub through flight demonstrations and and public outreach, so that we can. Uh, inspire culture of excellence and, and uh, you know, love for country effectively. So um, it's a big, it, it almost feels like a big kind of uh, weight on your shoulders and you want to do it right. And, and at, at, we're just fortunate that we have 143 people on our team that all feel that way about our mission and take it very seriously. So uh, we, we take it incredibly seriously. Um, it, it is a complete commitment and focus, but at the same point, you know, when you get to where, this blue angel crest that, that, you know, 1% of 1% of 1% of naval aviation, every gets the opportunity to do, uh, it's very meaningful to you. And you get to zip up this, you know, Batman suit that makes you, you know, it just kind of completes the, uh, the persona of, of what you're going out and doing. And I, and I don't mean that in an arrogance way. I mean, that kind of the contrary of you put it on and it reminds you of the responsibility that you now bear that, um, you know, we have, people that are out, you know, at the tip of the sphere around the world deployed, you know, flying on an aircraft carrier at night, 
completing real world missions and, and your jobs to go and show that to the American public and, and represent the excellence that they're, that they're doing, you know, in real life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's so important. Say it's a, mm. it, it, and it's just, uh, you don't, uh, not a day goes by. I think that we've, we, I, I've never taken that for granted and, and I don't intend to. Fantastic stuff. Well, look, um, I'm just so fascinated to find how you got to this stage, though. So for my first question, what I wanted to ask was, I'd just love to go back in time a bit so we can get a picture of you and your career and also maybe some ideas for future aviators who might be listening in. So just tell me about your backstory then. So when and why did you join? And just walk me through your career to now becoming the Blue Angels XO and maybe a little bit about what that job entails. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to share that. And I think that that's an important part of uh, each one of our stories. That, that we all have, every member of our team. Uh, so I'm happy to share mine. Mine, mine began, uh, I was born in Midland, Texas, and I, I lived there till about first grade. Midland, Texas, uh, you know, mainly known uh, you know, as an oil town or a football town, high school football town, pretty famous one. And so uh, those are a couple of things early on that, you know, sort of frame my life with, uh, with the, my parents and, and all growing up. And um, so first grade, I moved to uh, Fort Worth, Texas, where I grew up for the rest of my time throughout high school. And, um, you know, my my story very early on is just being blessed with a great family. Uh, not everyone has that. I've learned that on this team too. That sometimes the Blue Angels is, is is the family for a lot of people, or the Navy or the Marine Corps. Their service might be their family because they were not so fortunate uh, in in their life. And it's pretty cool when you see that come together in service. That you know you become brothers and sisters with these people because it means so much to them. But uh, I, I was very fortunate. I had a, a family that loved me and took care of me and, and provided me with resources and opportunities so that I could be successful. And um, one thing, you know, my parents always instilled in me was that, you know, good things happen to good people. And so character um, mattering was was something they instilled in me. And I don't, I don't think that that means that you it always works out. Um, in every instance, it certainly doesn't, you know, bad things still happen. But at, at the end of the day, uh, if you do the right things and you work hard and you, you know, be a nice person, be a good person, um, uh, that, that it all works out in the end. And I still believe that to this day. So kind of following those uh, wise words and, and kind of wise ways of my family, um, like I said, I grew up watching airplanes take off out of what was Carswell Air Force Base. It's now Navy Joint Reserve Base, Fort Worth, and uh, Naval, the Naval Air Station there. And we'd get to see all these aircraft taking off from it. Lockheed has a plant there, and they share it with the base. So F-16s used to always be flying out of there. Nowadays, it's F-35 with the Joint Strike Fighter being produced there on the line, tested and flown out of there constantly. And then um, it used to be a you know bomber base, and so there were these massive bombers there. Um, and then there's still all kinds of other assets, C one thirties and whatnot that that are in and out. So it was a busy base and we're fortunate to have a big air shows come through each year and th they were fun to watch. And it was just really cool to be a part of that. My grandfather worked at, at general dynamics at the time producing the F 16. So I had all these like cards with the F 16 on it, you know, and all the international partners and I'd have them pinned up around my room along with all the, you know, various sports uh, stars that I admired. So uh, sports and, you know, jets were kind of things that just, uh, you know, I, I grew up um, kind of watching and keeping stats on. And, you know, those are the things that if you would ask, you know, little 10 year old John Faye, what he was going to do that one of those things was probably the thing that stood out the most. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, you know, and I had uh, a, a big brother and a big sister ahead of me that just did right. And I tried to model the example that they'd set. And unfortunately, they set a great one and I, I tried to follow it. And uh, that ultimately led me uh, to the Naval Academy, the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, where my brother was already there. And I got to see, you know, my parents, uh, the way that they they looked at my brother when he came home from school and wearing his uniform or when we'd go up there to to watch football games that he was, he was playing on the team there. Um, we'd go up there and they, you know, walk around the campus and just the, the honor and the, the big nobility, you know, that the place stood for and just this, you know, honor code that people adhered to uh, all that stuff was just uh, for, for, for me at the time being, you know, freshman, sophomore in high school, I was just 
you know, wide eyed on it, just blown away by it, um, everything that it stood for. And, and that's what meant something to me is it stood for something, something bigger than the individual that was there. And um, I wanted to, I think I wanted to serve. I think discipline was always something that um, I felt was important. It was something certainly that my parents, <laughs> you know, how they ran our family, discipline is a part of it. But I think, I think kids crave discipline, you know, secretly. They'll, they'll never, you know, rightfully admit it, but um, it's every bit necessary and it, 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 it helps make you a better young adult. Um, so I, I pursued that and, you know, lo and behold, 24 years after graduating, it wasn't just a four year college decision. It was a 28 year decision for me. So, uh, you know, it, it, it meant a job. It meant doing something exciting, something rewarding, something that was honorable. And, um, you know, I kind of just put my head down and, and went after it. Nice. What a backstory. And so for, for those listening, can you just um, give us just a quick rundown of basically your role in the Blue Angels and how you came about getting that role? So basically just a little bit of info about what it is you do uh, day to day, week to week. Yeah, so I'm a uh, I'm the executive officer for the Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron, the Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron, also known as the Blue Angels. Um, as the executive officer, my job is to assist the commanding officer, which our commanding officer is our flight leader. That's the number one jet. Um, he also, uh, he's, he's the commanding officer. So, so in charge, uh, and responsible for the squadron, we call him the boss. So I assist the boss in implementing the policies, programs, and plans for the squadron. What does that all amount to? I am the, the chief executive, uh, for the command. So trying to basically buy decision space, decision, you know, time, uh, just take anything off the boss's plate so that uh, he or she would not have to deal with that. And, you know, flying a, uh, a, a six jet flight demonstration that, you know, encompasses 143 people as well as a C-130J asset um, for all our logistical support. It's a monumental tasking. And, a lot of the bandwidth of the boss is is taken up by flying this flight demonstration. We're flying six days a week. Um, and, you know, we could talk about how close and at what speeds and, and all these other factors that go into it. But needless to say, that's a lot on one person's shoulders. And so uh, the Navy figured out that it was uh, it was necessary to add an executive officer position to kind of help corral all that and ensure that everyone's pointed in the right direction. And I always say, you know, you don't have to lead Blue Angels. You just get to help aim them mm -hmm. because 143 Blue Angels, everyone's committed to the mission. They care. They're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just need to help make sure that everyone's synced up and we're all kind of aimed in that right direction. And I, I, I get the, the privilege of being able to do that. Fantastic. Now, it's clearly a very, very important mission and it's ran by incredibly passionate people. But so for those listening now, um, I'd love if you could just explain to me a little bit more about what the mission of the Blue Angels actually is like. The What is everyone in the team working towards? So before we dig into the specifics of what goes on there, um, can you tell us what is the ultimate mission, goal and purpose of the Blue Angels? And also in times like now where global conflict is on the rise and heating up, how vital is recruitment in the Blue Angels mission? Absolutely. So uh, on April 24th, 1946, uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz, was the chief of naval officer, uh, the the CNO, uh, and and he uh, tasked Navy officials with establishing the Navy Flight Exhibition Team. So, uh, at the the waning days of World War II, uh, naval aviation was such a, an incredible force uh, and, and decisive force in in the in, in winning that war that they were worried uh, that because of naval aviation's inherent design, it's out of sight, out of mind. Everything is forward deployed. It's around the world. You won't see uh, most Navy, you know, assets operating within, you know, the, the United States necessarily because our mission is just by, by design, it's forward deployed. We're, you're, you know, we're out getting it accomplished around the world. So to do that, they, they wanted this uh, Navy flight exhibition team to be able to showcase what naval aviation did. And so our, our mission today, you know, 77 years later, uh, our mission statement is to showcase the teamwork and professionalism of the United States Navy and Marine Corps through flight demonstrations and public outreach to, to, um, to uh, in, inspire a culture of excellence, 
and and love for country. So what does that mean? You know, at the end of the day, I, I think it means, you know, your our mission is to to inspire. It's it's to leave people. Um, we are, you know, we, we can be a recruitment asset or tool, certainly, because we want to expose people to what's out there and what, you know, you don't have to just be a jet pilot. You can be a, you can be a crew chief. You can be a logistician. You could be an admin professional that's working behind the scenes to ensure that all the paperwork and all the administrative needs are met. There's just so many roles that you can fill within the Navy and Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're out there to, to, to showcase that, to show that that exists and that you can contribute. But beyond that too, we want, we want all our, our air show attendees or people that interact with us, whether that's in public outreach opportunities or just seeing us fly by, we want them to want to be a better version of themselves. And I think, that extends so much just beyond the performance aspect. And we're very, very big on performance, you know, and precision. That is what we do. We show up on time. We have a precise way of balance. We want us to look polished and very put together and synchronized. That is part of what we do. It's part of our performance and part of kind of the way that we train everyone on our team to be. But I think an even bigger facet of that is the, the character behind it. Um, and in this day and age, you know, social media and all these things that everyone's trying to have this polished look and be this and that. I think the real thing behind it all is character, you know, being being someone who's committed to being something better every day, a better version of themselves, um, constantly improving, seeking perfection and having a bar no lower than excellence. Um, those kinds of things matter, but you get it because character matters. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that we ever want anyone to think that the performance then outweighs our, our character. It certainly doesn't. It's really the character allows for that level mm -hmm. of performance. Um, but, uh, you know, we want, we want people to leave with goosebumps and, and watching, watching our, our pilots that are working incredibly hard in the air and our maintainers on the ground that are making sure six up jets get to go fly. We want them leaving, wanting to go, boy, I can, you know, I can go do anything I want to because I just watched this amazing performance and the music and the, the narration and all these things. And it just synced up very nicely to where you want to just go, you know, tackle whatever the world hands you. Absolutely. Speed is life. Speed is life. And yeah, someone who uh, is, is very, very incredible uh, said that no one does it like the Blue Angels. And um, actually, I want to I want to just talk to you about this then. So it's, it's quite funny because I spoke to. Uh, a guy called Tom Trotter, callsign Trots. He was the former commander of Top Gun and he uh, was commander of a carrier air wing as well. And I've actually just noted down the metrics here. So this guy had 1,000 carrier landings, 17,000 hours flying, 5,000 of those hours in tactical jets. And during the podcast, he said that he always wanted to be a Blue Angel and he applied and he didn't get selected. And this is the former commander of Top Gun. So please can you just explain to me how good you've got to be to become a blue angels pilot and what are kind of like some of the the metrics that you have to hit there to even be considered i mean what sort of an absolute machine do you have to be well i, I don't personally know trots but i think he's being pretty uh pretty humble in saying that because that's a obviously a very accomplished career and and again that one speaks to um you know, the exclusivity of, of some roles and some, some of the metrics you, you, you know, laid out there. One, I mean, even to just be a carrier air wing commander is um, a phenomenal achievement that not many, uh, not everyone gets. Um, you know, in our, uh, in, in naval aviation, at least, I guess that's what I can speak to. Uh, there are certain career paths and, and um, you know, you, you have opportunities in your career where you can choose different routes and the Blue Angels doesn't always fit in with um, career timing for some individuals. Um, there are minimum requirements that we have for flight hours and things like that. And I, I think most pilots would, you know, achieve that. But, um, you know, to, to, you know, for him to, to be uh, the commanding officer of Top Gun, well, that means he's a Top Gun graduate first off, right? So uh, that is a career timing specific and a performance specific as well. So certain things you have to do to, to meet those things. I, I'm not surprised. Um, 
people just get on different career tracks and, and, and they can kind of go different ways and they may converge at different points and all, but, um, not surprised. Um, sounds like a, a, an incredible career, but, uh, maybe it didn't work out for the blue angels thing, but, uh, top gun is a, a very exclusive, incredible thing. And we should be so thankful that we have people that go and spend the time to become experts that they are, because those are the top, uh, fighter, you know, top fighter pilots, uh, at least from a, a tactical perspective in the world. Mm. And that's, you know, wars are, wars are won there with the, the training that's accomplished. Um, I can also speak to the fact that, uh, you know, this kind of also fits in, I think with your, you know, your previous question, um, I applied and didn't get it as well on my first time. So it's not uncommon that you end up applying multiple times or, you know, rushing the team multiple times in order to be selected. And sometimes, you know, you're equally rushing the team as much as the team's rushing you and you have to be the right fit for that, that team. And within our officer wardrobe, we have a nearly 50% turnover every year. Um, I think that's a pretty key figure because the, you know, the corporate world is blown away by that, that fact. Fifty percent turnover within the Delta, fifty percent turnover within our wardroom, and about a thirty to forty percent turnover within the command overall, with all our enlisted maintainers and support staff as well. So, uh, how do you run uh, an, an elite, world class, iconic organization when you have nearly fifty percent turnover? Well, you do it because you have just various traits and attributes that you stick to that that make you what you are with your mission and your culture. Mm, absolutely i mean there's no doubt about it it's not just i mean that's the mistake people make as well they see the visual side of things but they don't see the, the enormous amount of effort that people have to go through behind the scenes to be able to do everything from just maintaining these things to the logistics to the pr i think it's absolutely fascinating um but obviously what we do see is crazy crazy stuff um in the fight displays but so something you know from a sports background i've always found that i tend to adapt to my environment so although it may suck for a while if you really put yourself in situations where you have to overexert and you're really just taking it to the next level you do tend to adapt to that stuff and then we look at the blue angels and what they do it's so extreme and looks so dangerous but i just want to ask you know what are some of the extreme practices and applications of teamwork and leadership that the blue angels use in pretty much situations where you know if one guy sneezes or has a little cough or something you know it could potentially be a disaster um you know what does the communication sound like over the radio when they're doing the maneuvers and um are there any teamwork methods that they use which we could apply in the business world and life absolutely i'll try and uh be uh the most succinct right up front and saying that Teamwork and trust are, you know, the bedrock of, of what we do. Those are probably the two things out of what you mentioned of, you know, these dangerous things. And uh, I always like to say, you know, you, you're, we're, you, you know, you're learning to do dangerous things carefully as possible. Right. So uh, naval aviation, is, it's inherently dangerous, you know, and, and especially flying at high speeds close together in, in these formations and all. It's uh, it, it can be a, a dangerous thing if you're not applying the right, um, you know, mitigations and, and safety, you know, controls. So, um, we do that through teamwork and trust. Those are foundations of, of what we, what we, you know, how we exist as a team, um, within that precision, that's certainly, you know, part of it as well. We are precise in the way that we conduct our schedule day to day, uh, in terms of showing up on time. Um, we have a set time that we all show up ahead of our brief so that we start preparing ourselves mentally. Um, you know, we're not having paperwork dropped on us or just different things that become a distraction to what is our ultimate mission of the day. And that's the flight demonstration because the flight demonstration is what allows us to accomplish that mission. It's, it's the mechanism. So we start prepping about uh, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on the circumstances prior to our brief that morning. So, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, let's just say for a practice day, if we're going to practice at 9.15, that means everyone is in the squadron, um, from the, at least from the, the, the pilots, uh, are in ready to, to kind of start warming up for the day at 8.30. And then by 9.05, 10 minutes prior to our brief, we're going to be in the briefing room. And then um, we're going to be ready to start the brief exactly at that 9.15 time. 
and, and the boss will kick it off by going over the administrative items and the different operational uh, requirements. And then they'll go through the, the flight briefing for whatever type of show we're doing that day. We have four different shows based on the way the weather, what weather we are dealing with. Um, and when, and they, those can be adjusted uh, real time. But we'll go in. Let's say we're going to do a high show because we've got beautiful weather. And boss will go through the administrative requirements, brief the high show. And in doing that, we're going through the flight demonstration and we'll have a, we'll have like a, a chart that, that shows our, the, the airfield that we're operating out of and the show point, and the center area that everything that optically, everything is, you know, the most visually aesthetic point is called sh- uh, center point. And that's the center marker that they're aiming for, for the different solos, the solos being five and six for their hits where they, you know, it looks like they're converging. Yeah. That's going to be at center point. And then the diamond, that's one through four, uh, the four of them together, that they're going to be, you know, apexing and, and presenting uh, perpendicular knife edge wings at you, those types of things. That's all built around center point. And the boss is going to be walking through the different cadences and the different calls in terms of what we're in for. You know, we're in for the diamond 360. And then you'll see the pilots mapping out their the course they will be flying together over their chart so that visually they're tying themselves with what checkpoints they're seeing with where they're going to be relative to one another because the diamonds and the solos are kind of these opposing acts it's always keeping a jet out in front of the crowd and so they're doing that while the solos are mapping their track and and boss is going through it and we'll pick a couple couple maneuvers that day that they're going to go over as a group and you'll see them when that maneuver comes up let's just say for the diamond, it's the diamond 360. And then they're going to push back in their seats. They're going to adjust their seats as they are in the jet. And, you know, we, I don't know if we have another moment to talk about. It, but one thing that's unique about the Blue Angels is our pilots do not fly with jet, uh, with uh, G-suits. You know, G-suits are the bladders that that inflate when you're under um, under certain G-forces to be able to keep the blood up, you know, in your in your in your head because the g-forces naturally will, will pull it down mm. so between their their g-strain maneuver where they're they're pushing that blood up they're you know they're straining they also fly with a stick that has a 40 pound pressure on it nose down so they're pulling back uh on f- a 40 pound stick with their arm and they'll we call it a fulcrum the way that they set on their knee with their arm holding that stick so that's not just you know a bicep curl for 45 minutes instead it's that leveraging force on their leg well you can't have a, a g suit that will inflate because that would cause the mm-hmm. elbow to move so they're holding that they're holding that stick in what they call their fulcrum position and if i'm the right wing and i'm number two right wing i'm looking left i've got my left hand on the throttle my right hand is on the stick and i'm i'm flying position relative to the boss Conversely, if I'm number three, I'm the left wing, I've got my left hand on the throttle, still my right hand on the stick, but I'm in a different position because I'm now looking right at the boss. And then if I'm number four, the slot, I'm looking up directly under the boss's uh, burners or, you know, burner cans. So um, those, those are the different positions. And when they go back in that position, again, the visual, the visualization that they're practicing, they're going to go to that position, whatever, whatever position they are, they're in that and they're going to close their eyes. And they're going to visualize where they are. Boss is going to be going through this cadence of exactly the way it's going to be in flight. He's going to say something like, uh, you know, we're rolling out the Diamond 360. And number four is going to go in with his comment of let's take it in, meaning let's go into that tight formation set. And he'll say, all right, coming left. You know, the the bank is set. We're in in 360. And then they're all going to acknowledge like you would in a formation flight. Uh, Cheese. Uh, Stalin, Jamami, that's two, three, and four, acknowledging their position or acknowledging that call. Um, uh, he, he, they're going to keep going in that turn, and then uh, he'll have a couple of the calls. And you'll see them making the adjustments. If it's a, a little pull, you'll see them. That means that they're pulling back on the stick with, with their arm, all in unison as they're visualizing. So they're, they're visualizing this game, and they're seeing it all at the same time because of that cadence that's being repeated. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool to witness, to hear, it's almost, uh, like a trance in the, in the way that everyone's so into it. But I think that that visualization is one, one, one kind of thing that you've talked about with, um, could that apply in the real world? Certainly. I mean, there's so many athletes that use visualization to achieve greatness, you know, Kobe Bryant, and, 
uh, you know, Tiger Woods, all these, other, you know, all these professional athletes that, that don't just, they don't just go, you know, visualize, all right, I'm going to go to do, you know, I'm going to go do this step. They, they know they visualize the hit, they visualize the winning shot, you know, all those things. So the visualization piece, the, the repetition is key. Like I mentioned earlier, we're flying six days a week. It's a perishable skill set. But if, you know, if you go more than two or three days of not, not flying and going through um, all these different maneuvers and cadences that it starts to atrophy and, and you can't be as precise. And when I say precise, we're talking, you know, flying upwards of 300 miles an hour, 300 you know, knots or so at 200 feet in an angle of bank turn, 18 inches apart from one another. Yeah. Um, that means that in our closest set, that Diamond 360, that uh, two and three, their wingtips are incredibly close apart, but they're looking up directly above their canopy to where they could grab the boss's wing. Mm-hmm. That's how close they are, 18 inches. And if you could roll down a canopy, if that were possible, they'd be able to grab that wing. And um, they're doing it under all these, you know, different, you know, regimes of flight with, you know, what we call texture, which is effectively turbulence. You know, when you have a little bit of little bumps, they're bumping together. Um, you do that because you work so hard at it. You're so well-practiced and versed at it. And it becomes a, a culture of we're doing this every day, doing it together, doing it at this precise level that requires extreme focus. Um, I think that that all of those points are, um, you know, important and, and would translate very well to the business yeah. world. Uh, the other part is, is just, you know, setting culture, you know, uh, our culture, we have, we have different, you know, policies that define who we are and the way we act. And it's all meant to, to ensure that we're presenting the best version of ourselves and the best version for the Navy and Marine Corps and how we conduct ourselves. Mm, absolutely. Um, those are all important things that we, that we adhere to how we doing guys we're just going to take a really quick time out from the podcast here to just introduce you to a brand called asali asali make aviation inspired leather goods such as bags travel bags pilot bags leather luggage tags wallets just a plethora of really awesome handmade handcrafted customized leather goods out of the uk it's truly fantastic i'd like to mention that this is completely non-paid for and non-sponsored but is a true reflection of just what i think about the brand and they have decided to help the show out by giving our listeners a 10% discount with the code TALK4 at checkout or in the basket. Guys, without further ado, let's get back over to Commander John Fay from the Blue Angels and just check out the link in the description for our look at Asali Designs and their awesome products. Cheers. Wow. I mean, it's 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 just evidently clear just how professional this team is and how seriously they take the professionalism side of it i mean it's it's fantastic and i think definitely one of the key areas that must be really beneficial for the team and improvement is the debrief and i think businesses and people even personally in projects and things that they're working on should get better at debriefing and i'm sure uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that the blue angels are masters of this um so i'm just wondering do you think you could maybe obviously not to reveal sources and methods but maybe you could give us a few pointers uh improving debriefs are there some really key factors that the blue angels focus on during a debrief that potentially could also apply to a business setting with projects or even like an athlete approaching their career for example absolutely absolutely louis um and I'm glad that you I'm glad that you segue to that because it would be uh, it would be such a miss if we didn't talk about the debrief because the flight preparation and execution is only 50 percent of it. Not, I dare say 49 percent of it. Right. Uh, we're doing this six days a week. But guess what we're also doing six days a week? We're debriefing six days a week. Um, you, we don't do a flight without a debrief. Uh, that means, you know, where they're leaving a show on Sunday. When we pack up and fly out of that air show site on Sunday evening, immediately following a flight, guess what we're doing when we land in Pensacola? We're debriefing that night before we go home to our families. So it's something that obviously means a lot to us. And it's an incredible uh, ingredient uh, to, you know, it, it within our recipe of success. So the debrief, um, yeah, you know, uh, the debrief is just run on uh, opus, uh, being open and honest with one, one another. And, um, you know, critical self-assessment, taking ownership and accountability for your mistakes. You know, none of us is perfect. E- you know, even the most uh, experienced Blue Angel pilot, whether you've been on the team four years or, or one year, you're going to make mistakes. It's going to happen. We've never had the perfect demo, but we are always 
always shooting for the perfect demo. And in the end, we achieve excellence that way. So in the debrief, it'll start with uh, every person kind of going around the room in a very professional, uh, organized fashion to where you'll cite the things that you messed up, and whether that's a safety, as in something that could have been a safety concern or something that may have been more of a procedural miss. And then um, you'll have specific goals and you'll identify whether you achieved them or not. Go around the room, watch the video for the flight demonstration. Oh, by the way, our flight demonstration is roughly 45 minutes long and a debrief is roughly an hour and a half long. So it's frame by frame. Um, it reminds me of days playing football where you're in there watching team film. It's the same, same concept. You're identifying things that you, you messed up on, things you did well and, you know, you're assessing that and how can you go about fixing it? It's you know, the basic OODA, uh, OODA loop type example. So in doing that, we're going to go through, we're going to find, you know, different, you know, errors or uh, things that were presented and how we dealt with them. We'll analyze it and, and, and look to fix it. And at the end of the end of the debrief, we'll wrap it up with things to work on. So identified things to work on for the next, uh, the next time. And then, um, or, I'm sorry, excuse me, you'll, We'll go to uh, assessments of how you did for the previous things you identified that you needed to work on and then things to work on for the next time. So you're going to say like, hey, here's where, you know, specific goals that I wanted to achieve or work on. Did I meet them or not? And then these are the things that I'm going to work on going forward. And it ends with a, a, an affirmative statement that, that captures the relentless optimism that is is it's both contagious and it's necessary with our team. And it's a statement called glad to be here. And glad to be here is what we say at the end of every debrief. Every, every team member will say that. I'm glad to be here, boss. And it acknowledges that not only are you uh, occupying this unique time and space and, you know, this, this, this job, this opportunity, but it's everything that led you to that point as well. It's being, um, you know, it's a statement of gratitude and it's a statement of optimism. Mm, absolutely i mean yeah i mean i already said it but it's just so much professionalism there and that's really actionable info thank you so much for that um what you mentioned there is that the flight demonstration has gone for about 45 minutes and this is no easy thing like this is very tight turns very aggressive stuff a lot of the time and uh just for the aviation geek and fan that's in me i, I was absolutely privileged to uh, have flown an l39 albatross with a top gun uh, graduate in the past and pulled about six and a half g's and it's quite funny because when we were doing the flight um i kind of said to him over the intercom i said so his call sign was whiz i said whiz um yeah what does this kind of compare like to the f-18 or something and in his you know american accent pretty charismatic guy he was like dude it's like a toyota next to a bugatti and stuff so just <laughs> just t just tell me a little bit about what it's like to sit in an f-18 and just go max after burner and how many g's do you typically kind of pull do during these these events yeah um well, you know i'm a I'm, I'm a naval flight officer which you know, puts me in the back seat uh, of these aircraft and so one of the questions we'll get a lot of times wearing you know the blue flight suit is people naturally think you're one of the pilots and that's not always the case with us because again we have a, a whole support team that you know that really are kind of the the backbone to this uh, this whole operation even happening and so i you know, I usually just like to say that, you know, hey, I didn't, you know, I didn't fly in one of the number of jets today, but I get the opportunity to fly in the back seat of them. And man, it's, you know, it's so cool. Um, you know, what, what, an, uh, you know, what a privilege to be able to, to get to do that. And uh, it is, it's amazing. Well, one, just watching it, watching how close, uh, watching how quickly the join ups happen and, and the performance aspect of it. Um, from a performance standpoint, to answer your question, you know, I've, uh, in the F-18 with the Super Hornet uh, in, in the back there with our team, you know, I think we've hit upwards of 7.7, 7.9 G's on some of the, the uh, some of the maneuvers. And, uh, you know, that, that can be either instantaneous or it can be kind of a sustained G too. And there's a little bit of difference, you know, and, but, you know, pulling six and a half G sustained, you know, uh, in, in some, you know, kind of maneuver maybe behind the crowd might be more dynamic than just that, you know, a quick seven, seven or seven, nine punch. It just sort of depends on, on, you know, what the, the flight regime uh, and what the aircraft's doing, but uh, it's a workout. It, it is a, a complete workout. You're uh, it's, it's as much cardio as it is a, a plyo, you know, strength exercise too, because you are employing all your muscles to keep that blood from, from pooling down at your legs uh, under positive G at least. So um, you're, you're working. 
uh, it's it's a ride like no other though. Uh, the, the best <laughs> roller coaster ride ever. Oh my god, I can totally imagine that. And it, yeah, it's it's funny because I had um uh John Corsan Rain Waters on the podcast before a really great guy, and we kind of spoke about how many calories. Yeah, he wearing wears a Garmin watch or whatever during the F sixteen demo, and he, the the amount of calories you burn just by sitting there and doing that stuff in just even a short space of time is absolutely insane but look i'm sure we've uh we've got loads of really avid listeners hopefully some young youngsters too who are, are really hoping to to join um last question then a nice way to kind of round this off john is uh we likely like i said have some young future aviators tuned in right now um what would be a good career path to go down if your dream is eventually the blue angels and also any kind of career tips and strategy for our future aviators that might be thinking of joining the navy or the military tree yeah no i uh a great question and I, i'm happy to chime in on that i'd say first and foremost you know you got to work hard no matter what you do you got to work hard and have big dreams don't let your doubts get in the way of those dreams and uh if you want to be a blue angel then you got to set out to, to to do it and you know intensity sometimes uh we're we're a culture that we we acknowledge intensity and then we 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 kind of glance over consistency but you got to consistently work at it too. It doesn't just happen overnight. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to work hard, you can't go and have one hard workout. You, you have a bunch of sustained workouts, right? That, that you're, you're pushing yourself. That's how you grow. So um, it all starts with working hard and caring and caring about others and caring about what you do, because there's really very few things in life that you can go and do as an individual. It's most life's pretty much a team sport. And it certainly is within the blue angels. So you got to be a good teammate as well. Um, work hard, work hard in school, work hard off, you know, whether that's on the field, in the boardroom, you know, uh, at the breakfast table, whatever it may be, you got to work hard and care about what you're doing Mm -hmm. and uh, develop those around you as well. Um, On a more, you know, technical level, um, you know, whether you, if you want to go fly within the Navy, the Marine Corps, uh, heck, even Air Force, Army, Coast Guard, you name it. it really doesn't, it matters less about what you go and you major in in college because as an officer, we all have college degrees. So, uh, you know, within, within flight training, you have to, you have to be a commissioned officer. So you, you need to go to, go to college mm-hmm. and that itself takes work. And I think, you know, I've heard it best said that, you know, college is really just showing that you can, you know, you can show up, that you can be dependable and you can commit yourself to something and that's getting your, getting your degree. So you go and do that. And then you go, you get commission, whatever, you know, whether that's your commissioning source being the Naval Academy uh, or, or an ac- service academy, uh, ROTC or officer candidate school after graduating from a different uh, college or university. Um, then you then you go into flight training and, and um, you know, part of that's luck. I mean, you can you can prepare all day and, you know, but do everything right. and It can still not work out for you. And, you know. To some degree, that that's my story. Um, yeah. I I'm a naval flight officer. I'm a backseater because at the time I was I was 2030 in my left eye. I'm 2020 overall, but my left eye was 2030. And um, back, you know, I'm the old guy that you know graduated. I'm not going to say when, but it was only 2020 to to go be a pilot. Mm-hmm. So I went and became a naval flight officer, and and that that was my contribution. And that, and that you know I learned how to to excel in that role. But um, I really wanted to be a pilot. And so, you know, someone who's sitting here, uh, you know, as a blue angel and it, it maybe has this appearance that everything in my life has worked out. Uh, I've, I can tell you, I've failed more times than I've succeeded. I, I guarantee it. But um, through that, I've learned to fail forward and to, to learn from my failures and, and make sure that I can turn those into future successes uh, optimistically. So um, and I plan to keep doing that you know, going forward. So that'd be my advice to your young listeners is set goals and then set, um, you know, short, short short-term goals and, and, um, you know, with identified, um, things that you need to achieve to, to reach those long-term goals. Mm. I'd like to add one thing here as well. I think this ties back so nicely to the beginning of the podcast where you said that good things happen to good people. And I think as well that for someone listening right now, you don't have to be a Blue Angel. You don't have to be a pilot to act like that. As you said, the Blue Angels are inspiring and they are 
a an icon a national icon which is to elevate people's professionalism and to inspire people and i think that you don't have to be a blue angel to start being a blue angel in your own head like you could literally take a different approach to how you attack right now or tomorrow and if you keep doing that and keep being that person in your own head for the rest of your life you never know where it's going to take you and it might just end up becoming the real thing not just in your head it might just be the real thing too um I, I just yeah. I think if you like you said you put good ass into the world and it, it comes back doesn't it absolutely you know and uh we're not just you know we don't just have a blue angel standard when it comes to a flight demonstration we have a blue angel standard throughout everything because we're representatives of the navy and marine corps so when that means i'm signing you know putting my signature on a piece of paper administratively i want to make sure that we're upholding the blue angel standard with with that document with that product that's coming out that has you know words that reflect our our character and our, our mission, mm. um, everything we do, there's no minutia in the blue angels. And, um, it's, that's the burden that, that we bear, uh, because of the high standard and the, the brand that we represent. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a mic drop and I think that is the perfect way to round that off. But yeah, look, John, my God, that, that's been the four questions for today. And uh, before we wrap this up, it is time for the classic shameless plug moment. So please feel free to take a minute and just promote anything that you're working on, anything that you want people to take a look at or just something you believe in. Floor is yours. Louis, I think, um, you know, what I've taken away from me uh, with with this tour, two and a half years um, traveling around with the Blue Angels is uh, first and, and foremost, uh, we we are so blessed to, you know, to, uh, you know, I'm going to say with with, the, you know, at least traveling around the United States, just what an amazing country we have and, and the people th that make it. Um, but that not only just, you know, extends with the United States, I, you know, my background, I've worked with many of our partner nations as well. And, you know, we are that, you know, beacon of excellence in, in the world, uh, to kind of shamelessly pull from, from what the Thunderbirds like to talk about of a beacon ex excellence, or, you know, like I said, we say a culture of excellence, you know, just, we, we are, um, you always hear that, you know, you're in the that top percent of the world, uh, top 1% of the world, if you're, you know, fortunate to live in, in this country. Um, and that, that's the case. I've, I've gotten to see it firsthand. We, we are so lucky. We have such a great place and it's a, it's a, an honor and something that we need to, to fight for. Um, the other thing is, yeah, performance matters, but so does character. And it's important to be a person of character because again, character is what unlocks that ultimate performance. So, um, I would say for all your, all your listeners out there, character matters and go out there and aspire to be a better version every day of yourself uh, through hard work, whether that's hard work, sacrifice, being a team player, all those things go out and, and shoot to be elite. Because in the end, excellence will be what you catch and we'll be better off for it. And, uh, you know, lastly, I'd just like to say that, again, I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> what a way to round it off and such good advice john honestly i'm thank you so much for this honestly it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for joining me today for the talk for a podcast just absolutely thrilled by the whole thing and um pleasure to have met you thank you Louis. likewise awesome and guys thank you for listening to this has been episode 91 and if you'd like to listen in for the past episodes go and have a look at our channel and if you'd like to listen in for the future ones make sure to hit that subscribe button and spread some love by leaving a like and a comment signing off for now and yeah gotta be done it's a blue angels podcast fight on see you next time <laughs>